Welcome to FRC Media News for Thursday, November 1st, 2018. I'm Keith Thibault. The effort to recall Mayor Jaziel Correa is underway and we'll hear from the petitioners leading that campaign. We have highlights from the peaceful protest of residents opposed to the closing of St. Anne's Church. And we get you prepared for Tuesday's election by looking at ballot questions one and three. But first, let's check in with the news headlines of the week. We bring in Will Richmond, the digital news editor at the Herald News. Will, welcome back. Good to see you again, Keith. Let's get right into it again. Uh, this week, uh, the recall uh, uh, petition has officially been approved. The affidavit was approved with 10 city residents um, moving forward on the recall. So now the process is underway. Those residents have uh, 20 days to collect a little over 2,500 uh, signatures. And um, I guess, first of all, Will, just uh, the process moving forward after the 20 days, what will happen? So if they're able to obtain the, the required signatures, uh, the uh, order would then go down to the city council. At that point, the city council asked the mayor to resign if he, he has five days to respond to that uh, to that question. If he does not or declines, then the process would begin to uh, schedule a vote for the recall and uh, get it on the ballot. And there are potentially, and we'll get to this in a moment, there are potentially still a lot of obstacles that uh, the recall uh, petitioners will face. We had the opportunity uh, earlier this week uh, to catch up with the uh, recall petitioners as they were in government center file in their papers, and we ask them whether they feel they'll be successful in their effort. I, I have no fear whatsoever. Look, this entire thing became an insult to the city. This became a big slap in Fall River's face. There were a lot of people, hardworking people in this city, who are angry right now. They're hurt right now. And if they stop and think how much this hurts our ability to, to do business as a city, with businesses as well as with Boston, our, our politicians in Boston, it's, it's crippling. It is absolutely crippling. If I wanted to put a business in at the industrial park and I knew I had to go to the sixth floor and sit across the table from this gentleman, I'd be talking to New Bedford right now. Mayor Correa has said time and time again, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. Step down, go fight your fight. If you're innocent on all these counts, come back and say, I told you so, now elect me mayor again. But in the meantime, let the business of the city go on, unimpaired. And that's the problem here right now. Our ability to do business is crippled by the fact that we have a mayor who lacks credibility. You said you did talk to the mayor? I did speak with the mayor on Tuesday outside of the city council meeting. And he wanted, to, he wanted to tell me that he supported this recall and that he would be willing to sign the petition himself. And I will bring it to him. I can't right now because we have polling downstairs and you can't pass around a petition within 150 feet of a poll. He actually said he would sign it? He did indeed. I have a witness to that. He said it uh, right there outside of city council chambers. Did that surprise you? I would think most people would be surprised by that. When he told me he would be willing to sign his own petition to be recalled from office, I explained to him that I thought that was perfectly, perfectly reasonable because he himself signs a recall petition for the last mayor that was recalled. And you are speaking about Mayor Jesu Correa. Correct. And he signs the recall papers for Will Flanagan. So if he believes in our democratic process enough to sign his own recall papers, I'll take him up on that. Two of the petitioners from uh, earlier this week, Will, uh, they are uh, obviously driven in what they want to do. but. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to, to take place here. Um, as we mentioned, uh, it looks like the, the petitioners will need 2,500, 2,510. That's been the number that's been reported of, uh, of uh, uh, registered voters to, to sign to move the recall forward. I would expect that there's going to be uh, a lot of questions concerning the validity of some of those signatures, something that I think we did see four years ago with the recall of Mayor Flanagan, correct? Yeah, certainly any time you're collecting signatures, um, you know, there's a, there's a sort of rule of thumb, and this goes for when candidates are collecting signatures to get on a ballot, that you should get at least 10% more than what is required because there should be the expectation that, uh, you know, some of those signatures won't be valid, they won't be, uh, you know, they won't belong to registered voters, so they won't be usable, or they may just be so ineligible, ineligible that they can't, uh, they can't be made out to ensure that they are 
certifiable uh, of a registered voter as well. Mm. In response uh, to the recall this week, uh, you, we heard from one of the uh, one of the recall petitioners, Don Surrett, saying that the mayor had indicated to her that he would sign uh, the recall petition. He came out this week and asking his supporters not to sign that recall petition if uh, they are asked uh, to do so. So uh, the mayor is trying to drum up uh, his support going forward. There was also a story uh, later on uh, this week, Will, in the middle of the week, where um, the city council scheduled to meet this coming Tuesday to take up those three items that were uh, brought up during a special meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, that the mayor had uh, wished to uh, address the city council. City Council President Cliff Ponzi is, has said he's been uh, willing to allow the mayor to speak as long as the mayor accepts questions from councilors. Those who speak uh, from the public during citizen input time uh, are uh, under that, uh, that uh, regulation, if you will, that they can address the council, but maybe ask some questions from the floor of the city council. Today, the mayor was on a uh, web interview with the Fall River reporter, and it was indicated today uh, during that interview that it looks like the mayor will not ask to speak before the city council. Any Anything else we can glean from that, Will? So certainly it seems at this point he doesn't want to open himself up to questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the letter that uh, City Council President Cliff Ponte had sent to the mayor regarding that request, he did warn him, you know, or suggest to him that he should consult with his attorneys before making his final decision on addressing the council, because I'm sure certainly there'd be some questions asked that given his statute or his stature uh, in the in this sort of court process, it wouldn't be wise to respond to. Uh, so at this point, you know, it seems he would not, he won't be addressing the council before that uh, those votes are taken next week and um, you know just kind of have to wait and see what types of questions he would as you mentioned in that interview most of them centered on his work as mayor mm -hmm. the how the city is doing right now pro you know economic development projects public safety there wasn't anything asked about his arrest and just a couple questions related to the uh, the recall. Yeah, very early on in that interview. And the mayor did say also in that interview that um, he would be providing information to the council for their meeting on Tuesday just on the work that he has done uh, recently in terms of uh, proving, if you will, that he's able to continue to, uh, to hold the office of mayor and conduct it in a way that uh, will uh, do the city well moving forward. All right, and the city council uh, will be meeting on Tuesday, and um, it's still anticipated, Will, that those three motions, one to temporarily remove the mayor from office, the other uh, two having to do with his outright resignation, calling for his outright resignation, and also a vote on no confidence. Those will expect it to be come up on Tuesday night? At this point, those would be the ones to expect. We'll certainly know for certain uh, come Friday afternoon when the agenda is typically released to yep. the public. So, but at this point, it would seem those three questions would continue to move forward for the full council to address. All right. I'm sure we'll have a follow-up next week. What's coming up over the next few days at the paper? Well, we'll wrap up our previews of uh, some of the races coming up that will show up on Tuesday's ballot because uh, we do have an election still going on. <laughs> uh, so we'll be taking a look at some of the more local races after our look at some of the statewide races last week. All right. Very good. Have a great week. We'll talk to you uh, next, next week. All right. See you then, Keith. We'll have more FRC Media News after this. Here are some job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Licensed Practical Nurse, Next Step Healthcare, located at 1748 Highland Avenue, is looking for an experienced full-time licensed practical nurse to provide prescribed medical treatment and personal services to residents in a rehab facility, job number 113, 13167. Food service worker, cashier, Atlantis Charter School, located at 37 Park Street, is seeking a part-time food service worker, cashier, to operate point-of-sale system, assist the chef, and prepare and clean the coffee stations. Job number 11308510. Maintenance technician, Whirlpool Corporation, located at 88 Current Road, is in need of a full-time maintenance technician to perform a variety of duties involved in the preventative maintenance of plant facility equipment. Job number 11309976. 
South Coast Health System, located at 363 Highland Avenue, is looking to fulfill the following full-time positions. MRI Technologist, job number 1131847. Nursing Assistant, job number 1131839. Bristol Community College, located at 777 Ellsbury Street, is looking to fulfill the following full-time positions. Assistant Director, Upward Bound Program, job number 1131614. Employee and Labor Relations Specialist, job number 1131095. For more information on these or other positions, visit masshiredjobquest.detma.org or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. St. Anne's Church will hold its last Mass at the end of the month after Bishop Edgar de Cunha decided to close the parish due to the inability to raise the appropriate funds to repair the historic building. A member of the planning committee convened to find solutions to generate $5 million needed for initial construction work helped organize a protest this past weekend in opposition to the bishop's decision. Our role on the committee was to raise money, uh, to see how we could raise money, how we could sustain the parish. Um, and we were told we had three months and we had to give names of people that we thought could don donate it. I told the consultant that there's no way we can do this in three months. And uh, after two months, we gave them some names. Um, and after two months, they called us in and they said, this isn't gonna work. And we want you to sign this thing saying that we, that we did everything we could. And uh, I refused to sign it uh, because it, I asked them for a year. I said, we need at least a year to put together something uh, where we can come up with this. So as far as I'm concerned, it was, the decision was already made and the consultant was there to make it look like we wanted the church closed and that we did everything we can. And that's absolutely not true. All right, Richard, can you just tell me why you organized it? Yes, because I want to keep the, ch the church and the shrine open to the public of Fall River. This is a landmark, this is a historic building for the Catholic community, and it deserves the, the recognition that it deserves. Now, the church is saying there's not enough parishioners. What's your feeling about that? I understand there's not enough parishioners, but the shrine itself is a sacred place, and the shrine should remain open. Now, if we don't have enough people to attend the Mass and the church closes, that's very understandable. The funds are not there. But as far as the building and the shrine, I think the shrine should remain open for generations to come. Do you think that the church has done all it could? Can? No, not at all. I think they've neglected it. I think they've waited too long, and I think now it's just easier to kick the church down the road. Do you think that they have worked hard to get more parishioners to come? No, they haven't. I think they've left the parishioner. I think they've left that up to the parishioners themselves to get more people to come. John Kearns, the communications director for the diocese, says the bishop saw the committee's planning outcome in a different light. What came? from the bishops many listening sessions over the winter and spring uh, was the feeling from many of our people that we need to share more, that there are too many parishes, everyone trying to do the same thing, particularly in the city where the, most of our churches are concentrated, resources are, resources are fewer, um, and people aren't, par parishioners aren't what they used to be either. So by sharing, by more efficient use of resources, that um, we can kind of rebuild some of these parishes and they can continue to serve the faithful here in the city learned uh, today that a couple of other chapels will be cl also closing at the end of the month. The Holy Rosary Chapel on Beatty Street and also the Holy Cross Chapel on Pulaski Street will also be closing later on in November. Thanks to the efforts of a junior at BMC Durfee High School in Fall River, the city's emergency service personnel have new ride-alongs. Let's take a look. Well, for a while, I've been wanting to do a stuffed animal drive and have these stuffed animals go to um, children who are under the care or who are encountered by first responders. As a kid that has been through trauma and I have been in the back of an ambulance with sirens blaring, I know how overwhelming it was and how just scared I was. And if I had a stuffed animal, it would have been so much more comforting and I, it would have built some sort of trust. So I just wanted to do that for other students and especially for the city of Fall River where 
through so much negativity, I think we, we need a lot more positivity. Um, and we wanted to, as a Mary's Youth Council, as a whole group, we wanted to thank all of the first responders who dedicate their service and commitment to the city and who are always there to help the city out. It's tradition carrying on, and that's important. And she was right. The police, the fire, and the EMS. When you see us, it's usually something that's tragic and, and very tough for people, adults to take, never mind young adults, and we forget how vulnerable they are to that. So rural company things like this mean a lot. So I want to thank you personally. We have more right after this. Hi, today on Hot Dogs, Cool Cats, uh, we have Flip. Uh, she's a 10-year-old beagle. She does get along with older kids. Um, and she does get along with other dogs. She may be 10, but she is a puppy at heart and does have quite a bit of life right now. She is very happy and excited. She loves getting attention from people. And she does have a chicken allergy. Um, so she just can't eat anything with chicken in it. She does like to go for walks. So if you want to come down and meet her, um, come down and visit us at Forever Paws. Uh, we're located on 300 Linwood Street, Forever Mass. Hello, welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. I'd like to introduce to you today, Jumper. He's a three and a half year old male neuter. Um, his owners couldn't keep him. He was an owner surrender. He would probably prefer a house that didn't have a whole lot of goings on. He is very shy, shy to the point of he likes to hide under blankets and things like that. Um, but he is very sweet and very needy. And since he is 20 pounds or more, he's going to need brushing and you can see he loves it. So, if you like to dote on your cat, like to brush him like babies, and want someone who's gonna follow you to the ends of the earth, come and see Jumper. Jumper would love to see you. Oh, and he has double paws. Everybody loves double paws. I show him, high five. I wish you could do high fives, but there they are. The election day is Tuesday, and we wrap up our look at the state ballot questions facing voters. Today, we'll focus on question one, dealing with nurse staffing, and question three, transgender rights. I had the opportunity to speak with those supporting a yes vote on those two issues. We did invite opposition to those questions to take part. However, we did not receive a response. As we prepare for the November 6th state election, we're taking the opportunity to inform all of you about the three ballot initiatives on the ballot of this year. This week, we're gonna focus on ballot question number one, which has to do with nurse staffing. Joining me right now is Joan Ballantyne. She's a nurse at Norwood Hospital and also a member of the Massachusetts Nurses Association who is uh, imploring people to vote yes on question one. Joan, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. So, Joan, um, jo, what's, the, what's the, the background in terms of why people should vote yes on question one? Well, currently, unfortunately, in Massachusetts, there are no limits except for the intensive care unit as to the number of patients that any one RN can take care of at one time. In the ICU, currently, we have a, a, a law which says one ICU nurse can take a maximum of can take one patient and two patients if she thinks that's safe to do so. Mm -hmm. But the nurses on the med search floors, there are no limits there at all. Now, um, this would, uh, the, the, the limit in terms of how many patients a nurse can uh, oversee, it, it, it depends on uh, different departments and different situations, correct. correct? It's not like one size fits all. Can you explain that Ab a little bit? Absolutely not, absolutely not. Well, take for example, a med search floor. Everyone, normally that's where most people who come in with a, a pneumonia uncomplicated, some heart failure, something like that, they would be admitted to a med surge floor. With the ballot initiative, we are going to put forward that they have the nurses on the floor, on the med surge floor, has no more than four patients, a maximum of four. They can take less than four, but mm -hmm. no more than four. So that would be one nurse to a maximum of four patients. 
Now, does this initiative only concern hospitals? Does it also, in, uh, you know, uh, involve any other uh, healthcare fields like nursing homes and the like, or is it just restricted no. to hospitals? No, it's strictly inpatient hospitals. Okay. So, what will this mean to the nursing profession, in your opinion? Um, obviously, potentially more opportunities for nurses, correct? Well, absolutely. We have the highest per capita amount of nurses in the whole, in the state, and we have a huge amount of nurses. We have over three thousand nurses graduating every year. We have lots of nurses, lots of new grad nurses looking for jobs. And unfortunately, what happens very often is they are not given a full time job or even a even a job in the hospitals because there there is just no employment for them because the staffing is so tight within mm -hmm. the hospitals. Now, what will this uh, mean for, uh, it may be obvious to some people, maybe not, what, what will it mean for patients? Um, just getting more, well, more, more, more care in terms of uh, targeted care? Well, that, that's why we're doing this. Right. This is not for the nurses, this is for all of us in Massachusetts. This is for the, the citizens of Massachusetts because we're all going to be patients at one time or another. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be one, you're going to be one, we all are. And, and you need time with your nurse. And if your nurse has too many patients, she is not able to give you that time. Mm. The value of a bedside nurse, someone actually there, managing your care, taking care of you, watching you, making sure that you're getting your meds at the appropriate times, you understand why you're getting your medication. All of these issues are discussed with the bedside nurse ongoing. They mm. are there all the time watching over you. But if they have upwards of, gosh, who knows how many up to eight patients, how, how can they possibly spend quality time with their patient and make sure you are getting the care that you need? And that, that's what we're fighting for. I do need to ask you about uh, what some of the people who are on the no side of this issue are saying. They're saying that it will increase costs for hospital, hospitals and it may also in, in, um, as carry it over that these hospitals may charge patients for that increase in care. Uh, we have heard that some hospitals may be even threatening to shut down if this were, were to pass. How do you respond to those claims? Well, let's take the, the last one first. Sure. Mass, uh, in Massachusetts, who knows what will happen, but let's just go forward from there. Mm -hmm. In California, they've had this since 2004, and no hospital has closed due to this law in California, not one single one. And as to the cost of this, I think if you actually look at the cost that would provide patients with good care and there would be less admissions after being discharged because they didn't get the care that they needed, they would have less admissions due to not understanding the medications they'd gone home with. They would have actually lower costs because they're moving through the hospital quicker. They're getting better care. They're not languishing somewhere waiting for someone to come and care for them. Mm. They would get better care and they would be discharged sooner. And they would not be readmitted. That's a huge part of this. Many patients are discharged without a clear understanding of what their plan is for being discharged. Mm. So if you're discharged with an appropriate plan, right. you can actually make a plan and go forward and take care of yourself and not be readmitted with the same thing that you came in with. Right. So yes, it, it does save money. It saves money for the hospitals. And perhaps they could spend a little less in other areas. But that's a discussion for an, another sure, sure. another time. It, we are focused on the patient. That's, what, that's why we're doing this. All right, Joan Ballantyne uh, asking people to vote yes on question one. Thank you for joining us and all the best moving forward. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye now. We continue our look at the ballot questions that voters will be faced at the November 6th election. Today we'll be focusing on ballot question number three, which has to deal with transgender rights. Joining us right now is Matt Wilder. He is representing the Yes on Three campaign to have voters vote yes on question three in November. Matt, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks, Steve. Matt, in a nutshell, why should people uh, continue to support what's currently on the books here in Massachusetts in terms of transgender rights? Well, we're urging Massachusetts voters to vote yes on three on Election Day to uphold protections for transgender people from discrimination in all public places, like restaurants, retail shops, medical offices, essentially anywhere that isn't home, work, or school. You know, at the end of the day, this law is about treating others as we would want to be treated with dignity and respect, and that's what this law does. 
um, you know, uh, this is the, this ballot question is a little different than others. Uh, the the impetus is actually being driven by the no side of things. So, um, has it been a little difficult for you to to tell people that? Um, the no side is, is actually a no vote in this instance where normally when something is to be changed, the yes would make the change. This, the yes will keep things the way it is. Yes, it is a, a bit counterintuitive, um, but we are urging voters to remember to vote yes to uphold the law to protect transgender people. You know, I think it's um, a, the way it's worded is a virtue of state election law, but at the end of the day, a yes vote keeps this law on the books, which has been in place now for two years, signed by Governor Baker in 2016, and passed through the legislature with overwhelming bipartisan support. You know, our opponents like to focus on restrooms um, and locker rooms, but this law is about much more than that. And so uh, we're really trying to get the word out that this is about upholding dignity and respect for transgender neighbors, coworkers, and friends. You did mention that uh, the original initiative was supported by the governor and the legislature, of course, two different parties there. Have you seen uh, more widespread bipartisan support in terms of voting yes on this issue? I would say that this is the broadest support for any ballot question in a long time in Massachusetts, perhaps in Massachusetts history. We had uh, more than 1,500 coalition members who range in every profession from law enforcement sexual assault prevention agencies, the business community, small and large business, uh, labor unions, uh, faith leaders, you name it, they're with the Yes on 3 campaign because they know that this law makes our community safer and has now for two years. And in terms, of, you know, this is not a bipartisan a partisan issue, as you mentioned. Uh, Governor Baker has just recently come out and said that he will uh, vote yes. He said so in an editorial. Uh, because he knows that this law makes sense. It's just a common sense law uh, that protects transgender people in our community. Is another message that you're bringing to, uh, to the voters one that would be one of regression in terms of the strides that have been made for transgender uh, individuals, that this would be in some way a, a step back and, and not, uh, not progression here in the Commonwealth? Well, that's right. I mean, as we think about Massachusetts as being a real leader uh, in, on issues like this, I mean, we were, of course, the first state to uh, adopt same-sex marriage in the nation. Uh, and in a lot of ways, Massachusetts leads. When in 2016 this law was passed, we became uh, just the 17th state in the, in the country to pass these types of protections. Now uh, there are 19 states, Massachusetts among them. Every New England state has these protections. Uh, and, a, you know, a no vote would repeal these laws, strip these protections away, and really force us to take a step backwards uh, in, in civil rights and in, uh, in, our, in our values. And so it would really send a very strong message to the nation that um, if it can be repealed here, these rights can be repealed really anywhere in the country, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Matt Wilder from the Yes on 3 campaign, thank you for joining us, and all the best going forward. Thanks, Keith. Again, we did seek out comment from those in opposition to question one and question three, but did not receive a response. That'll do it for this edition of FRC Media News. You can watch FRC Media News Thursdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. and follow all our stories online at frcmedianews.org. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Make sure to vote on Tuesday. We'll see you next week.